Hello YouTube, thank you for clicking on this video and shout out to Big Daddy Algorithm for pimping it out to you. My name is Megan and welcome to my channel. Coming at you today with a topic that is a little bit taboo, but it's something that I'm very passionate about and have been researching for like basically my entire adult life. So it's something that is very close to my heart and I thought I would bring it to you today with like a little bit of research, a little bit of background, and I thought it's something that we could sort of all unpack together. As you can probably tell by the thumbnail of this video, it has to do with child freedom and the choice of whether or not to have kids, which is a hot topic right now. Um, so I hope to just kind of bring a little bit of context into this conversation. I myself am a child-free adult, so I do have a little bit of bias when it comes to this topic. So I just want to make you all aware of that, that I am coming at this with the perspective of somebody who is child-free and intends to remain so um, for the rest of my life. So just be aware that that is my bias. Also, before I forget, I want to remind remind you to uh, like and subscribe, do all the YouTube things. I talk about controversial things on this channel. I like to poke holes into some of society's most cherished institutions. Um, so if that's your jam, hit the subscribe button. I also do sewing tutorials and I talk about fashion and history and fashion history. So if you're into that as well, definitely subscribe, stick around. I would love to have you here. Jumping right into it today because we have a lot to cover and I try my best to keep my videos under an hour. So we need to just get right into it. This is a huge topic though and something that I'm personally very passionate about so I'm going to actually cover it in two parts so that I hopefully can do it justice. So this video today will be the first part and there will be another follow-up video as like sort of a part two so that'll be coming at you like probably in the next couple of weeks or so. But this first part today is going to examine some of the assumptions that society makes about parenthood and especially motherhood and the second part will look at how those assumptions play out in different parts of society like the tech industry, religious institutions, politics, patriarchy, and capitalism. So all of the isms we're going to be looking at in part two so stay tuned for that it'll probably be coming out like next week at some point if you've ever felt pressure to have kids but aren't sure if you genuinely want them this video is for you if you ended up having kids anyway and then immediately regretted every decision that ever led to their existence, even though you love them more than anything, obviously, then this video is for you. If you're queer and struggling against social norms that dictate what relationships and gender should look like, then this video is for you. If you're child-free and frustrated that everyone you know and love seems to be getting swallowed up by parenthood, then this video is for you. If you're a parent who feels like you're being swallowed up by parenthood, and that no one warned you how hard it was going to be, then this video is definitely for you. Overall, this is a topic that stokes the rage fires within me like no other, mostly because it's so tied up in gendered expectations of women, but I'll get to that in a bit. The idea that women are supposed to have kids and that we're inherently more nurturing and softer than men just because we're women is something that I've been very aware of and felt very rebellious of since childhood, even though I didn't have the framework or education back then to put words to those feelings. But I was always very hyper aware and critical of the way that society just expects women to have kids and to not think too deeply about it or question whether it's something that we truly and authentically desire or are even equipped to do. Turns out this expectation has a name and it's called pronatalism. What is pronatalism? Simply put, pronatalism is a cultural value that promotes having children. I'll be talking mostly about pronatalism as a concept in the Western world, but it also exists in many societies across the world. Pronatalism is not just a Western capitalist idea, but today we're going to be looking at it in a Western capitalist context because that's what's familiar to me and I don't feel that I'm really equipped to talk about like pronatalism in India or China or in Africa or any other society of which I am not a part because I am not a part of those societies. So we're going to be just examining it today in the context of Western capitalist society. Many parts of society hold pronatalism as a core value and are actually characterized by it. 
Religion promotes and enforces it. The patriarchy promotes and enforces it. Political movements and public policy have been based on it throughout history, not just today. And more recently, the tech world has begun to promote and enforce it, thanks to Elon Musk and his hysterical online ramblings about population collapse, when in reality, pronatalism is a major component in driving overpopulation across the globe. But I'll be examining that in more detail in part two, so I'm just going to leave that there for now. No matter who or what is encouraging it, pronatalism always has at its core the idea that women's primary role is to give birth in order to boost a country's native population. In pronatalist societies, women are told that we should have babies even when we don't want to, or that we should have more babies than we want to, and that having a baby is necessary in order for a woman to be socially worthy or admirable. Pronatalism doesn't just affect women, but it does affect women fem-presenting and AFAB people disproportionately because our unpaid physical, emotional, and reproductive labor is essential to the functioning of capitalist, patriarchal, and hierarchical societies societies. The assumptions that are built into pronatalism are everywhere and they seep into every aspect of our society from family structures to film, books and TV shows to schools to communities to public policy. I thought we'd start by unpacking some of these assumptions and examine them critically one by one. The assumptions that I'll be talking about all come from this book, The Baby Matrix by Laura Carroll, which I read last year. It's a fantastic book that's written manifesto style to give us some ideas about how to free ourselves from outdated thinking about parenthood and reproduction and create a better world through more communal ways of thinking and being. It was written in 2012, so it's already a bit outdated on its own, but a lot of the ideas in it still stand as we're still a fundamentally pronatalist capitalist society, especially with wingnuts like Elon Musk running around and screaming about population collapse. I think a lot of people think that there's too many many people on the planet, but I think there's, in fact, too few, and that the, the possibly the single greatest risk to human civilization is the uh, rapidly diminishing birth rate. The end is coming! Can't you feel it? Yes, yes. Thank you for the info. I'll be talking more concretely in part two about how pronatalism actually shows up in our society, but for now, I just want to introduce you to these assumptions and get us all to think more critically about them. They aren't necessarily conscious assumptions. It's not like we're running around consciously and purposefully telling ourselves that we need to have babies before we're 30 and our vaginas will dry up, or that child-free couples have sad and empty lives. For the most part, these assumptions are unconscious and automatic, kind of like compulsory heterosexuality, which I talked about in my last video. Go check it out if you haven't already. That's why I believe it's so important to talk about them, shed light on them, and expose the ways in which our society and culture shape the way that we relate to ourselves and to others. That's my hope with this video. I'm not here to blame, shame, or judge anyone for their choices, only to help shed some light on the broader social, economic, and political forces that play into those choices, and I really, really hope that that comes across in this video. So today we're going to be asking ourselves whose agenda these pronatalist assumptions really serve and whether they're still relevant in the hopefully post-colonial, post-capitalist society that we're hopefully slowly moving towards. Whether you want kids or not, whether you have them or not, I think it's worth examining why we make the choices that we make and how the factors that go into these decisions are ultimately bigger than us and our individual lives destiny. The first assumption of pronatalism is the idea that everyone is hardwired to want children, especially women, and that we all by default have a biological urge and instinct to have children. If you don't want children, the implication then becomes that something must be inherently wrong with you and that you must be deficient in some way. Women and AFAB people still grow up with this idea drilled into us that we'll wake up one day sometime between the ages of 25 and 30 with an urgent and all-consuming need to have a baby. Get a whiff of his head. I think my uterus just skipped a beat. This desire is expected to take over our brains and hijack our decision-making abilities, turning us into baby fever zombies hell-bent on being impregnated at any cost by anyone who's willing. I heard this many times growing up, especially as I asserted my desire to be child-free over and over again from the age of nine up until, well, now. 
I heard it from my mom, from the moms whose kids she babysat for, from my teachers, my friends' moms, my bosses, my coworkers. I heard it from books, from TV shows, from movies. You'll change your mind. Just wait until you're 25. Just wait until you meet the right person. I've met a few right people since becoming an adult and bupkis, nada. No matter how much I might have loved the men I've been with, not a single one of them has ever triggered a desire in me to have his baby. 25 came and went, then 30, and now at the age of almost 35, I can safely say that I have never not once woken up t-boned by an all-consuming need to get pregnant and give birth. We've all heard the phrase your biological clock is ticking and it's used to scare women into having children as soon as possible before we're no longer able to. It's long been presumed that women lose 90% of our viable eggs by the time we're 30 and that after 35, our fertility pretty much drops off a cliff, so we'd better hurry up and get pregnant before we miss out on the chance to become mothers. There is some truth to this. I'm not by any stretch of the imagination a biologist. Science is hard, so take this with a grain of salt. But from what I understand about the little bit of research I have done, apparently most of our eggs aren't actually lost through menstruation, but through a process called atresia. Atresia? Atresia? If you're a biologist, please weigh in because I'm not and I would love to hear from you and your perspective. Um, so basically this process is where eggs naturally degenerate inside the body as cell reproduction slows down over time. This is a very slow and gradual process though from what I've read and it takes decades for your eggs to no longer be actually viable. Generally speaking, for as long as you still have a period and assuming you don't have any lifelong reproductive issues, you can in theory still get pregnant. It's not at all impossible to have healthy pregnancies and babies after the age of 30. Obviously, since the average age of giving birth in Canada where I live has been over the age of 30 since 2010 and is increasing all the time. Most Canadian women are now waiting until their mid-30s to have kids, which is a full decade later than our parents' generation did, so clearly there aren't as many ancient, dried-up 30-year-old vaginas running around out there as our hysterical manosphere friends would like us to believe. Women in their 30s should be completely ignored by any man of substance value productivity. It's hard to get some genuine feminine softness out of a woman who's 30 and single. She's been through yeah, the fucking to track. While advanced maternal age, defined medically as 35 and older, can certainly result in a higher chance of things like genetic disorders, pregnancy complications, and conceiving multiples, because apparently the older you are, the more eggs get released at once, according to my research. According to my research. Which is wild to me, I had no idea. Um, but anyway, none of these things equal infertility and many of them are highly treatable through modern medicine and careful monitoring during pregnancy. Fertility doesn't actually stop until menopause, and for most of us, that's around the age of 50 or so, but the social pressures that compel us to have kids in our 20s and early 30s are huge and still going strong, even though there's little to no actual scientific and medical reasons to back them up. These arbitrary deadlines by which to reproduce are psychosocial, and they're reinforced everywhere this is pronatalism at work. So if we can all agree that the desire to have children is not entirely biological, then where did the idea of the biological clock even come from? Ah, I'm glad you asked. It comes from an article that was published in the Washington Post in 1978 called The Clock is Ticking for the Career Woman, and it was written to warn women about the dangers of focusing too much on our careers. It featured a protagonist who was written as a composite woman, a representation of all women between the ages of 27 and 35. The article is written from the point of view of a male reporter who interviews her about her feelings of desperation to become a mother while she's quickly running out of time to realize that dream. I've gone around a busy bee of a reporter from woman to woman. Most of them said that they could hear the clock ticking. Sometimes the composite woman is married and sometimes she is not. Sometimes horribly there there is no man on the horizon. What there is always, though, is a feeling that the clock is ticking. You hear it wherever you go. This article was written as a reaction to women's liberation, and it suggested that even if some of the gender double standards about sex were eroding, there would always be this difference. Women had to plan their love lives with an eye to having children before it was too late. 
Messages like this are meant to scare women, to warn us that if we wait too long, if we prioritize ourselves and our work and our hobbies and our friends and our communities too much, we'll miss out on this most fundamental experience of personal happiness and self-actualization, becoming a mother. This cultural fetishization of motherhood promotes unrealistic expectations as well as unnecessary panic and it encourages women to hurry up and find someone, anyone, to have a baby with, regardless of that person's suitability as a partner and a parent. This is dangerous for obvious reasons, especially when we're talking about women who date men. If wanting children was truly our biological destiny, if it really was a universal and uncontested physical instinct, then there would be no need for all of these cultural messages and social controls to encourage and support reproduction. Our urges to pee and drink water are instincts. They're not questioned, they're not talked about, they're not glorified and romanticized in the media. They don't have to be. They actually are universal biological instincts and therefore we don't have to think about them too much so we don't we just do them no human ever has gone through life without needing to pee or drink water Plenty of humans all the time go through life without needing to have sex or have children. None of this is meant to diminish or dismiss the very real longings that some women have to become mothers. I'm not at all questioning the validity or existence of those feelings. They are valid and they exist. What I am questioning is the extent to which they're framed as being natural, expected, fatalistic, uncontrollable, and fundamentally biological. Instead, it's far more likely that the all-consuming desire that some women experience to have a baby is largely psychosocial and so ingrained in us by our culture and by the media that it feels innate and biological. Actual scientists have been raising eyebrows at that article about the biological clock ever since it first came out. Shortly after it was published, researcher and psychoanalyst Dr. Frederick Wyatt said that when a woman says with feeling she craved her baby from within, she is putting biological language to what is psychological. Again, none of this is meant to diminish or dismiss the very real longing for children that men many women experience. It is, however, meant to challenge the sexist pronatalist assumption that for women, the urge to reproduce is innate, inevitable, natural, and normal. Assuming those things puts women at the mercy of our own bodies and chains us to them. It's the same logic that men have historically used to keep women out of positions of power by claiming that we're too hormonal to be able to make rational, sound decisions. The idea that motherhood is the natural biological destiny of all women not only only ignores the experiences of women who struggle with fertility complications, it also reduces us to our basic biology and sets us up to expect that motherhood will be the ultimate form of fulfillment, thereby disregarding other meaningful avenues to personal happiness like friends, hobbies, community, etc. I'll expand more on that in a bit, but essentially this assumption serves to keep women chained to the idea of a biological destiny, which serves the interests of capitalism and patriarchy because we then become dependent on men to help us fulfill that destiny. Women who reject motherhood are then seen as abnormal and unnatural and are held up as objects of pity. You know that old stereotype of like the bitter, gross, old spinster with tons of cats. What's that? It's a cat door for strays. You're not going to stuff me through that, are you? Oh, of course not. You'd upset the saucer of milk on the other side. (laughs) Pronatalism scares us into not becoming that woman. Motherhood bestows dignity upon us. And yes, we still have to get old and gross, but at least by becoming mothers, we can do so gracefully, having fulfilled our biological destiny and not having missed out on the culturally sanctioned institution of motherhood. That is what pronatalism instills in us. That is the fear that it gives us. And that is what we need to critically examine. Normality. The second assumption of pronatalism is that having kids is the norm and something must be wrong with you if you don't want them. This ties into the assumption that having kids is our destiny, but it also encompasses the idea that parenthood is the only path to fully mature adulthood. What this assumption ignores, though, is the fact that social norms shift over time. Just a few decades ago, same-sex marriage was still illegal in most places, and now we barely give it a second thought. Luckily, social norms around parenthood are starting to shift really radically for millennials and Gen Z, but many of us still have to come face-to-face with parents demanding grandkids, and a society that's built to privilege the nuclear family through public policies, peer pressure, and workplace dynamics. There are so many anecdotes about child-free people getting screwed over at work because parents are privileged and prioritized when it comes to things like vacations, time off, etc., and child-free people are often left to pick up the slack 
at work. This is all built into our social pronatalist assumption that parents should have a privileged position in society. And so therefore, it becomes only natural that you yourself would want to become a parent because you want that same privilege. And this is not necessarily something that is like consciously realized for most of us, but it does contribute to that overwhelming sense of peer pressure that a lot of us have to procreate. On top of that, having kids is seen as a sign that someone is psychologically healthy, but even a quick glance through forums like Facebook's I Regret Having Kids or the Regretful Parents subreddit suggests otherwise. This obviously begs the question then, what even is psychological health? The World Health Organization describes psychological health as a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to her or his community. Obviously, this is something that can and does fluctuate throughout our lives, regardless of whether we have kids or not. If any psychologists, therapists, or psychiatrists are watching this, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Like, what do you deem as psychological health? Please leave a comment. I would love to hear from you. But if we take this definition from the World Health Organization at face value, a person suffering from postpartum depression or a mother who regularly ignores her own needs in order to take care of her kids probably isn't experiencing optimal psychological health. Not to mention the fact that having kids in a society that glorifies the nuclear family and individualism can be a very isolating experience. Child-free people, myself included, complain all the time about how people we know and love become parents and then disappear into parenthood and we don't hear from them again for years until their kids are grown and they're no longer exhausted and overwhelmed. It's really hard to make a contribution to your community when you're trying to raise a family and keep everything together under capitalism. The nuclear family structure is fundamentally isolating and it's not great for our mental health. I could do a whole video just on that and at some point I probably will. But my point is that if a key component of psychological health is to be an active part of your community, then having kids in this society, if anything, takes us further away from that. Having kids is seen as the quickest way to becoming a fully fledged adult and certainly something can be said for people who have a kid and are finally motivated to pull themselves together and stop behaving in irresponsible or self-destructive ways. However, when we hear those stories, both fictional and in real life, about the party girl turned respectable mom and the broken guy turned responsible family man, we're probably not really seeing the full picture. Are the protagonists of these stories actually becoming mature and self-actualized as a result of having a kid, or are they just dissociating from unhealed parts of themselves without really addressing the underlying trauma and or neurodivergence that delayed their entry into adulthood in the first place? I'm not saying this is the case for everyone all the time who experiences these post-parenthood glow-ups. What I am saying is that we should be regarding these stories with a healthy dose of skepticism when we come across them because nine times out of ten, we're not getting the full picture. One movie that I always had a love-hate relationship with is The Waitress, the one from 2007 starring Carrie Russell. On the one hand, I love the 1950s candy-colored visuals and the friendship between the main character and her co-workers. On the other hand, I really, really, really deeply hate the message that having a baby will just magically fix all of your problems. For those of you who haven't seen it, the main character is in an abusive marriage with a deeply insecure man when she finds out that she's pregnant. She decides to go through with the pregnancy because she doesn't believe in abortion, but she's not happy about it. She goes through the movie silently resenting and hating the baby that's growing inside her, only to fall in love with it the second it's born, and then summon the strength to immediately turn her life around. Go like I that. want you the hell out of my life. You are never to touch me ever again. I am done with you. It's blatant pronatalist propaganda, and I deeply detest the message that if you find yourself in an abusive relationship, all you need to do is have a baby and all your problems will be solved. Was the main character psychologically healthy throughout the movie? No. Understandably so, she was a victim of domestic violence, and it was also heavily implied at one point in the film that she had some childhood trauma around her father either dying dying young or abandoning her and her mother. And she lives in a rural town in the American Bible Belt, so likely did not have access to a good therapist. Would giving birth magically bestow psychological and emotional health upon an individual in that same circumstance in real life? 
I'm going to hazard an educated guess and say no, probably not. Because in order to heal from trauma like hers or any kind of trauma period, you need therapy. Babies are not a substitute for therapy. Please do not have children as a way to consciously or subconsciously escape your own life and problems. If you think having a baby will fix your life or your relationship, please, please, please consider therapy instead. It's cheaper, it's easier on your body, and no innocent life has to get dragged into the picture. Real maturity is the ability to be responsible for yourself emotionally and psychologically. It means having emotional intelligence, cultivating empathy and self-awareness so that you don't let your issues affect other people to the best of your ability, and finding some sort of purpose in life that's meaningful to you. Having kids can absolutely help you to achieve these things, but it's not the only way or even necessarily the best way to get there. Hobbies, friends, community, meaningful work, all of these things can and do contribute to making us well-rounded, mature, and healthy, and there is a lot of scientific evidence to back that up. I'm going to leave some links in the description below that go into studies that have been done on happiness long-term and how having children affects our levels of happiness as we go through life, and it's really interesting to see the contrast between what society tells us will make us happy versus what the data actually shows will make us happy. And and I'm going to just sort of give it away right now. It's not having children. It doesn't necessarily make us any happier. If you want to get more in depth with it, I'm going to leave some links in the description below. I highly recommend that you check them out. At the end of the day, what our culture deems as normal isn't going to work for everyone. And some of the most cherished institutions of our society, like parenthood and marriage, are going to actually be detrimental to the psychological health of people who exist outside the norm, just as they are. Those of us who are queer or neurodivergent or even just very creative and free thinking are going to struggle under these institutions. For a lot of us, nuclear family life is going to seem like oppressive drudgery instead of an emotionally fulfilling project, and that's okay. That's where more radical forms of intimacy and community structures can come into play, and there needs to be room in our society for those as well. We're getting there, we're much closer than we were even just 10 years ago, but we're not there yet. Parenthood and marriage are still assumed to be where most of us will end up at some point in our lives. Marriage. The third assumption of pronatalism is that marriage exists solely to allow for the ideal conditions under which to birth and raise children. This is an old, old idea that goes all the way back to the first century AD when Caesar Augustus introduced a set of laws that encouraged people in the Roman Empire to have children by providing benefits to families who had three or more of them. These were history's first state-sanctioned benefits that were extended towards heterosexual couples with children, and that grand tradition continues on to this day. Tax incentives, baby bonuses, extended parental leave, and child tax benefits are all given to couples with children in many modern Western democracies. Since the first century, the patriarchs of the Catholic Church have continued to emphasize marriage and procreation as being essentially one and the same, and this idea is so ingrained into our culture that even today, married couples who announce that they have no intentions of ever having children are met with raised eyebrows. I personally have, at best, very lukewarm feelings towards the institution of marriage as a whole, but I do acknowledge that people get married for lots and lots of reasons. There are practical benefits like tax breaks and financial incentives and immigration, and there can be emotional benefits as well as long as both partners are actively working on themselves and equally take ownership of the day-to-day -day functioning of their lives and one doesn't dump the entire burden of the mental load on the other one's shoulders. In recent decades, there's been been a systematic unraveling of the bond between marriage and procreation, but many conservative religious and cultural enclaves still uphold it. Contraception is still discouraged between married couples in a lot of Christian denominations, and having babies is still largely viewed as the last and therefore greatest step on the relationship escalator. It's the entire reason that the escalator exists in the first place. When I was growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, there was still a lot of cultural pressure on women to hurry up and settle down, back to that biological clock again, and find someone who wants to marry us so that we can have babies before our vaginas dry up. 
That's the entire plot line of Charlotte's story in the original Sex and the City show. I heard phrases like, marry a man who loves you more than you love him a lot growing up, and there was this general idea that straight women should just suck it up and settle for anyone who's willing to marry and impregnate them, regardless of how they actually feel about the guy. They're told that they'll learn to love him, that it's all worth it for the children that they'll be able to have. Growing up, we heard story after story after story, both in the media and in our own lives, of women who were lukewarm or even straight up indifferent to their husbands at first, but they grew to love them over time as the men proved their love through great deeds or romantic gestures or by offering up domesticity and family as though these things are some sort of prize for women when study after study after study has shown that it's actually men who benefit from nuclear family life, but women are consistently worse off after marriage and motherhood than when they were single. I could do a whole video just on this topic. Let me know in the comments if that's something that you'd be interested in seeing. My point is that women are encouraged to hurry up and pick someone before we get old and dry up, and once we do, there's an expectation that we should be having kids soon after. Becoming parents is the final rung of the relationship escalator, and if we can't or won't take that final step, it's assumed that our lives will be empty, our relationships unfulfilled, and that our love for each other will stagnate. This idea is what underlines a lot of the marriage advice that exists out there for long-term cohabitating couples. Many professionals and couples who have been married for a long time promote the idea that monogamous couples need some sort of joint project or undertaking in order to keep them from getting bored with each other and drifting apart eventually. The implication here is that raising children is the natural joint venture for a couple, but barring that, there are plenty of other suggestions for how to keep things fresh. A 2023 listicle from marriage.com offers 30 different activities that a couple can do together to strengthen their bond in almost frantic succession. Reading it feels a bit like being offered a consolation prize, like a kind of desperately positive silver lining being presented to the reader. Okay, so you've decided to miss out on having children. That's okay. Your marriage doesn't have to be meaningless and boring. You can go for a hike instead. Volunteer with underprivileged children. Go bird watching. Schedule your sex life. These are all actual examples from the article, by the way. I'll link to it below. It's a pretty wild read if you want to check it out. There are tons of articles on the internet like this and lots of both religious religious and secular marriage counselors who offer the same advice. Once upon a time, I was in couples counseling with my ex-husband and our therapist loved to give us ideas for projects that we could do together as a way to bring us closer and give us something in common, which at that point just felt to me like, why are we even doing this? Wouldn't it just be better to break up? Which we eventually did. To me, all of this advice reads as a desperate attempt to fill in some sort of gaping hole that's assumed to exist at the center of every child-free couple's life and to enforce heterosexual monogamy. Is it maybe possible that humans are just not naturally monogamous? That we're not meant to live in isolationist nuclear families with the same romantic and sexual partner for decades and decades? Is it possible that all of this advice, all of this pushing of pronatalism onto monogamous heterosexual couples is so that they can throw themselves into the project of raising children as a way to distract themselves from the fact that late-stage capitalism and colonialist moralism deprives us of the integrated, close-knit communities that are actually biologically, psychologically, and socially fulfilling? Maybe? Maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but maybe the reason that marriage and pronatalism are so intertwined in our culture is because the way we've organized ourselves into these neoliberal, hyper-individualistic nuclear families is isn't actually that healthy for us physically and psychologically. Human beings are communal social animals. We're meant to live in communities. We're meant to raise children as a community. There's a reason that marriages get boring after two years, four years, seven years. We're not birds, we don't mate for life, and that's okay. The nuclear family project is actually very new historically. It's only been around for about half a century. And before that, for like most of human existence, we didn't actually live in these isolationist nuclear families. Again, that's another deep dive for another day, but my point is that heterosexual monogamous marriage is not necessarily like the natural default state for human beings and forcing us to be in those structures can be very damaging psychologically 
and unhealthy, both for ourselves and the children who are born of those unions. But capitalism needs nuclear families to function because the nuclear family is the ideal environment in which to raise the next generation of workers and consumers. I talked about this in my video about trad wives and how post-war American propaganda glorified the nuclear family as being the natural and desired expression of American-style capitalism. Monogamous heterosexual marriage is a relatively recent invention, and it's framed as a moral imperative, a sign of maturity and psychological health, and a natural thing for young people to aspire to. It functions as a locus of control from which to reproduce, both literally and figuratively, the norms and foundations of heteropatriarchy. In a 1987 article for Women's Own magazine, then-British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher perfectly summed up the neoliberal capitalist view of marriage and the nuclear family. People are casting their problems on society because they want government support, but there is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. The media and the advertising industry like to frame it as though families need capitalism in order to thrive, but actually capitalism needs the nuclear family in order to exist at all. It depends on women's unpaid physical, emotional, and reproductive labor in the home, which is done to support the man's career outside of the home. Like any abusive relationship, capitalism ensures its own survival by isolating us from grassroots communal social support networks and necessitates the consumption of goods and services in order to fill in the gaps that naturally would have been filled by friends, extended family, elders, and other members of the community. Heterosexual monogamous marriage doesn't automatically endow couples with the superpowers needed to raise children, especially when there's more than one child, so they have to spend money on things like daycare, toys, books, snacks, family family vacations, etc., in order to ensure that their kids' physical, psychological, and emotional needs are being adequately met because a lot of the time there's no community around them to do that. Capitalism equals pronatalism. Capitalist exploitation of married couples only lasts so long and then something else is needed for which goods and services can be bought. Once the wedding is over and the house is bought and filled with stuff, what comes next? What can people spend money on once all of that is behind them? Kids, that's what, and of course everyone should have as many of them as possible. Loneliness. Another assumption that pronatalism makes is that we'll be lonely in our old age if we don't have kids and settle down. Women especially are targeted by these messages both overtly and covertly. Child-free people get told all the time that if we don't have kids, we'll be lonely and sad in our old age, and there will be no one to take care of us, and we'll end up dying alone in a nursing home, yada yada, we've all heard it before. The idea that we should have kids just to have someone to take care of us is another way that we're encouraged to saddle our kids with jobs to do and expectations heaped on them before they're even born. There's often an unspoken and many times a spoken agreement between parents and their kids that the parents will provide care and support for their kids until they become adults, at which point their adult children will pay back that investment of time, resources, and emotional energy. This particular assumption betrays the underlying capitalist ideologies that are built into pronatalism and into the nuclear family structure in general. The idea that children are an investment that will pay out one day in the form of elder care is fundamentally transactional and also very flawed. As many care workers in retirement homes will tell you, a lot of kids don't visit their parents all that much and often it's your friends and community who will actually be there for you in old age and not your biological kids. I just want to tell you that at 81, I'm not sitting in a rocking chair. I'm not miserable because there are no grand grandkids around to play with. Today's a day where there's mixed sadness and happiness in my life. I'm going to be with my friend of 24 years who is now in the dying process in hospice. Yeah, it's sad, but what's even sadder is that all of her sister friends and brother friends have been here for her, to love her, to feed her, to hold her, to cry with her, but her own children, adult children, are not. People will say, well, did she deserve that? I don't know. But all I know is when I walk down the hall of this uh, hospice facility, very rarely do I see family. It's usually friends, friends who are bereft and friends who are happy to know that their friends are not going to suffer anymore. 
In 2012, a study conducted by the Pew Research Center found that 70% of American adults did not contribute to their elderly parents' care in any way. This was due to a variety of factors, including financial instability and strained relationships with parents. And even though the data is already 12 years old, we can only assume that these stats aren't any better now in 2024. Millennials and Gen Xers are the ones caring for elderly parents, with Gen X in particular being the new sandwich generation, providing care for both young children and aging parents simultaneously. According to another Pew Research study from 2022, Gen X carries the most debt out of any generation, and only 22% report that they're very confident that they'll be able to retire comfortably. A new study from September 2023 found that millennials are experiencing a widening wealth gap not just between themselves and older generations, but also within our generation itself. The wealthiest millennials possess about 20% more wealth than boomers did at their age, but the average millennial still has 30% less wealth than the average boomer did at their age. What this shows on average is that millennials are still the poorest generation since the Great Depression. There's no sign of this getting any better anytime soon, as many of us are still saddled with student debt, a lack of stable job opportunities, and a worsening economy racked by post-pandemic challenges, global conflict, and climate change. Gen Xers and Millennials, and most likely Gen Z as well when they come of age, aren't in the best position to care for elderly parents, and this will likely continue with Gen Alpha and into the future as well since none of the broader social and economic factors contributing to our general poverty are being addressed in any substantial way by the powers that be. On top of all this is also the consideration of healthy parent-child relationships and the question of whether or not your kids are even going to want to care for you in your old age. Children are entitled to care from their parents while they're still legally underage, but at no time are parents entitled to the same kind of care from their kids. Our kids aren't mini-me's and they're not extensions of ourselves. They're their own unique people and they're going to be different from us. They're going to have different interests, experiences, opinions, beliefs, and priorities, and a lot of the time those things aren't going to align with ours. Sometimes they're going to even be incompatible with ours, in which case it can be difficult to have healthy relationships with our adult kids. This can be really heartbreaking for both the parent and the child, and it can sometimes mean having to enforce really strict boundaries or even a parting of ways. Having kids isn't a guarantee that someone will be there for us in our old age, and if we go into parenthood with that mentality, we not only place a lot of unfair pressure and expectations onto our kids, but also do ourselves a massive disservice because we're then less likely to actively seek out and build community. A number of surveys from the 2010s found that there was no difference in the well-being of older adults who had never had children versus those who had. Dr. Melinda Forthover conducted a survey of over 850 retirees and found no significant differences in happiness levels between those who had children and those who hadn't. In fact, she found that those without children tended to have larger and more active social networks and communities than those with children. This makes a lot of sense because the way that parenthood is experienced in our society can be isolating, as I've already talked about, and can leave little time or energy to put towards actively building and seeking out community. Maybe the wealthier among us will have the time and resources to do this, but generally speaking, your average working class family just trying to make ends meet isn't going to have the time or the spoons to actively seek friends, community, and hobbies outside of their marriage and kids. This is why a lot of parents end up experiencing empty nest syndrome once their kids have grown up and moved out. They've spent so many years just trying to keep it all together, pouring themselves into parenthood and raising their kids that they no longer have anything outside of that. So when when that labor is no longer needed from them, they feel lost and have no idea who they are anymore. A life without kids allows you to continually explore and build upon your identity and to really get to know yourself at a deep level. It allows you to experiment with yourself and your life, to continuously try new things, to make new friends, to surround yourself with chosen family as well as biological family, assuming your family of origin is safe for you, and to really find and build community. These are all things that contribute to psychological health and build up your emotional and physical resources so that when you're old, you're surrounded by a chosen community of people who are there because they want to be, not just because they're bound by family ties and obligations. This is why 
why study after study over the past decade has shown that elders who are child-free are actually less likely to be lonely than their peers who did have kids. I'll link to the research below. It really is a fascinating read, and it flies in the face of all the scare tactics that pronatalism uses to try to coerce people into having kids. Becoming a parent isn't a safeguard against loneliness in old age. In fact, statistically, it means you're actually more likely to be lonely when you're old, especially if you're a woman who spent most of her life in a heterosexual relationship raising a straight man's kids. The right to reproduce. I want to be super careful when talking about this aspect of pronatalism because it can get into some eugenics territory really fast and that is not my intention here. What I really want to do in this section is prompt you to think about how we can weigh our desires for personal fulfillment and happiness with our obligations to do what's right for our communities and for the environment. Pronatalism reinforces and encourages the assumption that we all have the fundamental unquestionable right to have as many children as we want to. And and that the only precondition for parenthood is simply a desire to become a parent. Now, I am not suggesting in any way that this assumption should be managed on a mass political and social level because like China already did that and it was not so good. I want to be super clear about that. No one ever has the right to tell anyone what to do with their bodies, whether it has to do with having babies or aborting babies, period. What I am saying is that it's worth questioning on a personal level whether we ourselves are ready and able to have children and if we'll be able to raise those children in a way that adequately and consistently meets their physical and emotional needs and sets them up for a stable future. We know ourselves better than anyone and if we've examined our lives, our psychological and emotional emotional health, our goals, and the state of the world, and decided that having kids is or isn't for us, then we've made a sound informed decision. The point is not to decide one way or the other, it's that the decision should be informed and carefully weighed against all the personal and societal factors that will influence our ability to parent well. The personal is political, and what we decide individually has implications on a broader collective level. Our kids could end up being the next school shooters or the next Martin Luther Kings or more likely just average cogs in the machine desperately trying to hold it all together and make ends meet in this climate crisis, late stage capitalist hellscape just like the rest of us. The personal is political because politics, society, and culture determine how and where and when we make the decisions that we make. The idea that we all have a fundamental right to have as many kids as we want whenever we want is tricky and it can get into some really ethically gray areas. At the end of the day, though, that decision is never purely individual because bringing another human to live on this planet affects a far wider circle of people than just ourselves. Cultural narratives and social scripts are massively influential and can take a lifetime to unlearn, and not everyone is privileged to have access to the resources and information they need to start deconstructing those messages. Pronatalism tells us that the personal individual desire to have kids is the most important factor in the decision to become a parent, trumping any and all other considerations, and that's not an easy thing to unlearn because it's such a huge part of heteropatriarchy. It's all tied up in capitalist neoliberal values of individualism and the idea that our personal individual freedoms and desires always come before the well-being of the collective. The glorification of the individual plays out on all levels of society, not just when it comes to having kids. I mean, we saw it during COVID with all the debates around masking and social distancing. Pronatalism discourages us from deeply questioning how beneficial it is to have kids, not just for ourselves and our lives, but for the kids who will be born and for society and our communities. This is massively unfair to everyone involved, and it's also unfair to the parents who end up feeling exhausted, resentful, and guilty when parenthood ends up being a a lot harder than they were told it would be. Pronatalism tells us that not only should we be able to have as many children as we want to anytime we want to, but that if we do, somehow things will magically just work themselves out, so there's no need to really think too deeply about it. And everything in our culture reinforces this message. Think about all the movies you've seen about women who find themselves unexpectedly pregnant and then decide to keep the baby and then all of their problems just magically fix themselves. The Waitress, which I've already talked about, where the main character receives a check for 20 thousand dollars from an unexpected source so that she can buy the restaurant she works at and leave her abusive husband and provide for her and her daughter. This only happens after she's had her baby. 
knocked up where she keeps her baby and then ends up in a loving, committed relationship with its father and finds a happiness she never knew she'd have. Sugar and Spice, where she and her friends successfully rob a bank, set up a fund for pregnant cheerleaders, and then she marries her high school sweetheart and they live happily ever after. I could go on, but you get the gist. I heard countless times growing up that if I ever found myself pregnant and decided to keep it, everything would be okay because family would be there to help out and things would work themselves out. While it's a nice message and I definitely appreciated the support and love and sentiment behind it, ultimately messages like this only serve to reinforce the idea that having kids really isn't a big deal and that you don't need to think too deeply about it. When in fact, having kids is probably the biggest deal ever because those kids can't consent to life. They can't choose the circumstances they're being born into or the parents they have. Kids are completely at the mercy of whatever their parents and their society decides for them, and that bears careful consideration before deciding whether or not to do it. Forcing someone to be born and to live in a world where they'll have to contend with massive problems that they didn't create nor ask for has ethical implications that bear thinking about before before deciding to reproduce. Parenthood is not an undertaking that should be embarked upon just because we feel it will be a personally rewarding, fulfilling experience. Parental fulfillment. Another pronatalist assumption is the idea that children are supposed to fulfill us to inject meaning and happiness into our otherwise empty lives. This assumption effectively makes it the responsibility of our unborn children to provide us with some sort of purpose in life, to be our legacy, to fix all of our emotional, mental, and circumstantial problems, to be sources of comfort and care in our old age, to complete us, to make our lives worth living, to help us grow up by motivating us to be more responsible, disciplined, etc. That's a huge burden to place on the shoulders of little tiny babies. Children shouldn't be born with a job to do. Those kinds of cavalier cultural messages are extremely irresponsible and inconsiderate to those unborn children. It places the burden and responsibility for finding our own purpose in life directly onto them and sets us up for unhealthy codependent relationships with our kids. Pronatalism encourages this narrative and discourages us from deeply contemplating what a sense of purpose would look like to us, independent of cultural messages and pressure from friends and family. The romanticization of motherhood was part of post-World War II American capitalist propaganda, as I mentioned in a previous video, but it goes a lot farther back than that. Before the invention of modern Western medicine, childbirth was a dangerous undertaking that very often cost women their lives or the lives of their babies or both. Children often died young and surviving to adulthood was the exception, not the rule. All of this made it necessary for women to have as many children as possible to maximize their chances of as many children as possible surviving to adulthood, and it also made it necessary for motherhood to be romanticized and held up on a pedestal as some sort of ultimate vessel of personal happiness and fulfillment. Because without these myths and stories about magical motherhood, no one would ever do it. These stories aren't needed anymore because childbirth is a lot safer than it used to be, unless you're a black woman in the States and that's a whole other deep dive, but they're so ingrained into our culture now that it becomes difficult for us to separate those messages from what we ourselves truly desire. Motherhood isn't and never was all it's cracked up to be by the media, and it's dangerous to gloss over and ignore how difficult, heartbreaking, exhausting, tedious, and isolating it can be. Of course, it has its beautiful, profound, and awe-inspiring moments moments too. Like everything else in life, it's a mixture of challenges and rewards. But our culture tends to elevate all the good parts of motherhood to mythological proportions while ignoring the bad and even demonizing the mothers who are brave enough to speak up about how difficult it can be sometimes. So people dive in headfirst without really thinking about it, not always realizing that the realities of parenthood might not always match their expectations. Spend five minutes on a forum like Facebook's I Regret Having Children page or the Regretful Parents subreddit and you'll see story after story after story of people who had kids because they had all of these romantic, unrealistic ideas about what it would be like to be a parent and then realized very fast that the reality of it wasn't as rosy and fulfilling as they were told it would be. Last year, I read a book called Regretting Motherhood by Orna Donath, which was a sociological study of a group of Israeli women at all stages of motherhood who regretted having their children. Their kids ranged in age from a few months old to middle age, and all of their interviews were conducted anonymously to protect themselves and their families. 
The thing that stood out to me both in this book and in all the stories on all the forums that I've read is that commonly people don't actually regret the existence of their children. In fact, consistently, nearly everyone talks about how much they love their kids and how happy they are that they exist. The regret doesn't center on the existence of their kids so much as on the circumstances and environments in which they chose to have them. People most often regret the person they chose to have kids with, the financial situation they chose to have kids in, the sense of isolation that having kids can sometimes bring, and the loss of free time, autonomy, and identity that comes with parenthood. They don't regret the kids themselves. This is an important distinction to make because it suggests that parental regret most often has to do with environment, economics, relationship structures, and unmet expectations rather than the actual fact of becoming a parent. A lot of this has to do with the conditions of child rearing under neoliberal capitalism and the privatization of care that the nuclear family is set up for. The loss of communal care that our bodies and brains are hardwired for turn parenting into a burden. Pronatalism has to exist under heteronormative capitalism because without the fear-mongering about child-free people ending up lonely and bitter, a lot more people would probably choose to find fulfillment outside of parenthood. Beyond anecdotal and qualitative findings, there isn't a lot of hard data on how many parents actually regret their decision to have kids because there hasn't really been any good research on the topic. It's still fairly taboo, and understandably not a lot of people are willing to openly discuss it for fear of being labeled a bad parent or person, or that it will get back to their kids and do irreparable damage to those relationships. One study from December 2023 tried to actually measure and quantify parental regret and found that 5 to 14 percent of parents in Western democratic countries regretted their decision to have kids. But they mentioned in the study that they suspect the numbers are actually much higher and that stigma around parental regret, combined with the lack of a reliable way to survey for it, makes it almost impossible to accurately measure how many people actually experience this. All you have to do, though, is browse through any one of the online anonymous forums to get a sense of how many people out there actually regret their decision to have kids. It's a lot. And the stigmatization of this regret only reinforces the loneliness and isolation that results from having to dissociate from your authentic experiences and feelings just to make it through another day. The expectations that are perpetuated by our pronatalist society and the romanticization of motherhood that's so common in the media set parents up for disappointment and disillusionment, as well as the crippling guilt that comes with realizing you actually don't like having kids as much as you thought you would because you were never given realistic ideas of what having kids would be like. If everything you've ever grown up with consistently tells you that having children is your destiny, that sooner or later you'll become a parent and that everything will just work itself out in your favor once you do, of course you're not going to question that too deeply. Like compulsory heterosexuality, it's a cornerstone of patriarchal capitalist culture, and like fish in the ocean that can't perceive the water around them, you won't even know it's there unless somehow you're forced outside of it. Parenthood as choice, not destiny. As a child-free woman in my 30s, I am continually shocked at how many people out there still view parenthood, and especially motherhood, as being just something you do and not a choice among many. Despite the growing and very vocal movement of child-free adults in recent years, the majority of people will still end up becoming parents. A lot of that is due to social pressures and pronatalism, as we've already examined, and it means that it's more important than ever to raise awareness and education about parenthood being just another choice among many equally valid and fulfilling ones. To do this, we have to dismantle a lot of society's most cherished institutions first. As I mentioned earlier in the video, having kids is the very last step on the relationship escalator, and it's the entire reason that the escalator exists in the first place. If we want to topple parenthood from its privileged pedestal, we have to be critical of the relationship escalator in the first place and divorce ourselves, pun intended, from the idea that romantic and sexual relationships have to go anywhere at all. 
Maybe it's okay that your romantic and sexual partner is just that, a romantic and sexual partner. Maybe they don't have to be a housemate, a spouse, a life partner. Maybe other people in our lives can fulfill those roles as well. We also have to examine heteropatriarchy and ask ourselves how the ways in which motherhood is constructed serves the interests of patriarchy and contributes to keeping women from living truly fulfilling lives that don't center around men and children and the nuclear family. And we have to be critical of the nuclear family itself, of the ways in which it serves to isolate us from broader community, from chosen family, and how it encourages hierarchy by privileging our relationships with our spouses and children and deprioritizing our relationships with our friends, our extended family, and our mentors and other members of our community. All of this has to do with cultivating radical intimacy, which is a huge topic in and of itself, and it's worth a deep dive all on its own. But my point is that if we really want to make a world in which having children is just another choice like any other, then we need to critically examine a lot of the ways in which society is set up to privilege nuclear families and parenthood. We need to ask ourselves if these are things that we authentically and genuinely desire and weigh out all of the options so that we can make informed and educated decisions about whether or not to have children without any rose-colored glasses on. And we need to make space for parents to talk openly about their experiences, both good and bad, without stigmatizing and demonizing the ones who are brave enough to admit that maybe they would have been happier had they made a different choice or realized that parenthood is actually a choice in the first place. That's going to do it, my loves. This is a huge topic, and I feel like I just barely like scraped the surface of it. So I hope that I was able to do like that little bit of it justice. And thank you so much to all of you who have stuck with it all the way to the end. In part two, I'm going to talk a little bit more concretely about how pronatalism actually shows up in different aspects of society, like the tech industry, the media, religious institutions, and public policy. And I'm also going to talk more about parental regret and how we can work towards normalizing and destigmatizing it. So stay tuned for that. It'll be coming at you in like the next week or so. I hope that I've given everybody something to think about, whether you're a parent or not, whether you're considering children or not. I hope that I've given you just some food for thought and I also hope that I didn't make anybody feel like left out or feel ashamed for any choice that they've made either way because as I said earlier the personal is political and no choice that we make whether to have children or not exists in a vacuum. I think at the end of the day we should be supporting one another, building community whether we have children or not and I just really wanted to bring awareness to the overarching structures that factor into these really important decisions that we make as individuals. I know a lot of people in my life that I love and have immense amounts of respect for who have children and are doing a really amazing job of parenting those children and I think that they deserve all the love and the support in the world for doing what they're doing and I also think that child-free people deserve all the love and support in the world for making the informed choices that we have made. I think that it's really worth listening to each other's stories and experiences and learning from one another and at the end of the day I think it's really important to build a sense of community. So anyway, I feel like I'm rambling so I'm going to get off my soapbox now. Like I said in the beginning, this is a topic that I'm very passionate about. I spent so much of my life thinking about it. I've known since I was a little kid that I didn't want to have kids. And for me personally, it's like all tied up in gendered expectations of women. And a lot of my desire personally to not have children is a rebellion against gendered expectations of women. Um, I've always resented the fact that women are just like expected to have children. And since I was a little kid, I've been pushing back against that. And so for me personally, that's like a lot of the reason why I decided to not have children. There were other factors that went into that decision ultimately, but at the end of the day, um, for me, it just didn't feel like something that was authentic to me or to how I experience my womanhood and want to continue experiencing it. But I will get more into that in part two. For now, I hope that you're all having a good day and I hope that I've given you something to think about. And please be nice to one another in the comments. Um, I don't want to hear any hate for anyone and their decisions that they've made. I would just love to hear your stories, whether you have children or not, whether you regret that decision or not. I would love to hear your stories. If you're able to share them, that would be amazing and I would really appreciate it. And I hope that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you're having an awesome day. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you all in the next one. Toodaloo!